A method of myopia management that doesn't quite get enough of the spotlight as the other methods is called low-dose atropine. In this video, I'll touch upon what atropine is, its safety profile, and how it can be used for your child as an effective myopia management strategy. Watch on to learn more. Hey YouTube, my name is Dr. Natalie Chai. This channel brings you the latest science-based education and treatments in dry eye disease, myopia management, and specialty contact lenses to help you understand why it should matter to you for optimal eye health, function, comfort, and even beauty. If you remember from one of my earliest videos on myopia management, myopia is one of the most increasing prevalent vision issues in the US and Canada. The prevalence has increased by 25% from only four years ago and it is not slowing down. In fact, it is now a global pandemic in that by 2050, it is projected that nearly half of the world's population will be myopic, increasing the risk for permanent blinding conditions, thus becoming a strain on our healthcare system and indirectly to the economy. Now, the use of atropine has been used for a very long time in history for different reasons in medicine. In the context of myopia management, the first documentation of using atropine in the control of myopia can be dated back to over 150 years ago by Dutch ophthalmologist Franciscus Donders. Now you'd think given its long history it would be better known, however its adoption particularly in North America has been slow among eye doctors. We do see its use more in Eastern Asia as the prevalence of myopia is at a staggering 80% in some regions. Now here's some interesting fact checks. Number one, Atropine is an extract from the belladonna plant, or known as the Atropa belladonna. It is commonly known as the deadly nightshade or devil's cherries. Number two, belladonna means beautiful woman in Italian and was used by Venetian women of the court to dilate their own pupils for beauty. Number three, the plant itself is highly toxic and known for its poisonous nature. In addition to atropine, there are other extracts of the plant, including hyosamine and scopolamine, which are potent psychoactive alkaloids. So you may be wondering how in the world can atropine be used medicinally with all its toxic effects? Atropine certainly has a dark history. However, as with anything, it can be used for bad and now in our modern times it is now used for good in clinical medicine. For instance, it is used as an antidote to opium and chloroform poisoning. Various medicinal preparations have belladonna used as lotions to relieve pain from sciatica, gout, and even in slow heart rate or bradycardia. Topically, ophthalmologists have used atropine preparations to dilate patients' eyes for a prescription examination and to treat certain eye inflammations, such as uveitis. Since we're on the topic, let's address the question you may have, which is, what is the likelihood of getting poisoned by using atropine topical drops for your child, right? Let me first start by stating that in our modern world, atropine-related deaths are rare, even when taken orally or by injections. But yes, any topical drops we instill into our eyes does have connection points of passing through the puncta, which is the drainage portion of our eyes, to the nasolacrimal duct, and can be absorbed through the nasal mucosa into our bodies. In fact, for a lethal dose, a child would have to ingest orally 20 drops of 1% atropine or have the full absorption of 0.1% of atropine through the eyes. However, poisoning by way of the eye using low-dose atropine is likely impossible, even if this were to happen. This is due to the anatomical limitations of our eyes and atropine's quick metabolism. There are contraindications for atropine in small children children with congenital cardiac conditions such as patent ductus arteriosus or PDA. With that in mind though, we still want to make sure that with the atropine at home that the parents are storing it safely away from children. Let's go into the mechanism of action of how atropine actually works. Now don't worry if you don't understand how it works entirely because truth be told, researchers still don't really know the true mechanism yet. The fancy term for the mechanism of action of atropine is anti-muscarinic. It works through competitive inhibition of postganglionic acetylcholine receptors leading to parasympathetic inhibition for acetylcholine receptors in smooth muscle. What? 
If you'd like to learn more of the details of what this means, click here as I go in depth on this topic. Otherwise, in the context of myopia management, the exact mechanism of how atropine slows myopic progression is not entirely understood. One of the leading theories is that atropine affects signaling at the retinal photoreceptor level to impair axial elongation or the length of the eye, or that it acts directly on scleral fibroblasts to reduce scleral growth. Did you know that statistically, atropine has the highest effectiveness in decreasing myopia progression and axial length? Studies show anywhere from 50 percent to 80 percent. Now there are three pivotal studies that specifically look at atropine and low-dose atropine on myopia management. Now the first was the ADAM study or atropine for the treatment of myopia. This was a two-year study and it evaluated the efficacy and safety of topical atropine and slowing the progression of myopia and its axial length. The inclusion criteria was 6 to 12 year old Asian children with refractive error between minus 1 to minus 6 and a stigmatism value of minus 150 or less. Now they used 1% atropine versus a placebo. The result was that the placebo group increased on average minus 0.92 diopters and 0.4 millimeters axial length more than the atropine group. This concluded that atropine is effective in slowing progression and generally well tolerated. However, it did have visual side effects including blurred vision, especially up close, and also light sensitivity. Now with those unfavorable side effects, there came the second study. This was known as the ADAM2 study or the atropine for the treatment of myopia 2. Now this study looked at comparing the efficacy and visual side effects of three lower dosages, 0.5%, 0.1%, and 0.01% of atropine compared to the 1% they used in ADAM1. It included, again, 6 to 12 year old Asian children with refractive errors between minus two or greater and also minus 150 of astigmatism or less. The difference between each concentration for myopia progression and axial length increase was clinically insignificant. 0.01% had negligible effect on accommodation or focus at near and pupil size, and no effect on near visual acuity. This concluded that 0.01% atropine has minimal side effect compared to 0.5% and 0.1% and has comparable efficacy in controlling myopia progression. Now the third study is called the LAMP study. It stands for Low Concentration Atropine for Myopia Progression. They evaluated the efficacy and safety of low concentration atropine drops to see if they were able to determine the optimal concentration. So they looked at 0.05%, 0.025%, 0.01%, and of course the placebo group. The inclusion criteria included four to 12 year old children with refractive error of minus one or more, and also minus 250 astigmatism or less. They measured of course axial length and the spherical equivalent changes. Now there are actually four phases to the study and is actually still going on. In phase one, it was determined that all percentages reduced myopia progression along a concentration dependent response. In other words, the higher their concentration, the better the response. All concentrations were well tolerated without adverse effect on vision or quality of life. Now, ultimately, the study concluded that 0.05% was the most effective in controlling spherical equivalent progression and axial length elongation over one year. Now in the following year, in phase two, the placebo group was changed to the concentration found to be most effective from phase one, which was 0.05%. Now the results of phase two found that 0.05% atropine was around double that of the 0.01% group. With all of that being said, there are a few limitations and questions left unanswered, but there are a handful of new clinical studies that now address a more long-term timeline it also includes demographics outside of the Asian population. There's also no definitive guideline around prescribing practices of atropine in clinical practice. We also don't know the so-called exit strategy when a clinician chooses to stop atropine therapy. In other words, we don't know if we should stop cold or if a taper schedule is required to ensure little to no rebound effect. The general consensus is that the clinician should practice autonomously, practicing based on the response of the child and adjusting accordingly. The other
Another thing I always let parents know is that atropine exists behind the counter at pharmacies in the 1% concentration. Any other concentration is available only at a compounding pharmacy, so the drops are a little more expensive. However, most insurance companies do cover the cost. The dosage is usually one drop every night for the child with the help of the parent. Personally, I usually start with 0.05% atropine unless there are notable concerns with sensitivity of the child. I then bring back the child in about one week to follow up on any possible adverse effects and if so, we'll drop down to the next percentage of 0.025%. I will then have the child come back every three to six months and measure axial length to assess effectiveness. It is a very fluid process and changes are made depending on if the child's prescription increases at an unacceptable rate or if the axial length also increases at an unacceptable rate. Now in my practice, I also use atropine in combination therapy for the cases that have shown very quick progression. I sometimes use it with orthokeratology, Cooperville MySight lenses, and even with the Hoya MyoSmart lenses. Well, I hope you learned something today from the use of low-dose atropine. Now, does your child use atropine in their myopia management strategy plan? Let me know if you have any further questions around it. That's it for me, YouTube. If you enjoy learning about these topics and would like to keep up to date with the ever-changing science, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click the notification bell to make sure you don't miss my new video every second Thursday. Take care of your eyes and I'll see you in the next video.